Hello, everyone. Welcome to Saxworks Online. I'm Rachel Sklar, VP of Programming and Content for Saxworks. I'm so excited to have this amazing session today. Before I launch in, I'll just tell you very quickly, we are a membership club, a co-working space, a living room for you that is not your actual living room where you have been <laughs> using as your office for the past few years. Uh, we are all of that and more, plus a place where you can hang out with plants. Uh, we do have plants and this, this, is, this is real. Uh, I feel like I have to, <laughs> to make that disclaimer because it looks so healthy and wonderful um, for anyone who's seen the plants in my home. We have two locations. We are in the Saks Fifth Avenue flagship on Fifth Avenue on the 10th floor, and we are in Brookfield Place. That's where I am uh, in New York right now. We also just opened in Greenwich, Connecticut, and it's pretty nice out there. And, uh, and there have been some pretty amazing programs. So we really do invite you to come join us in any capacity. You can go to saxworks.com right now and get a complimentary day pass, and then just come on in and say hi. So that's my spiel for now. Welcome to Saxworks. I'm so excited to present Learn With The List, uh, with uh, The List, which is a fantastic women's networking group and just uh, like filled with the doers, movers, shakers, and leaders of today and tomorrow. I'm going to turn it over to Anne Chiquette, who's the CEO of The List, to introduce things right now. We've got Leah Bonvasuto today. I could not be more excited about this session, and I know I am going to learn uh, how to present myself articulately and impressively on Zoom, which clearly I am doing. So over to you, Anne and Leah. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, everybody. I'm Anne Choquette. I am the founder and CEO of New Power Media and owner of The List. I am thrilled to be here today. I'm also very grateful for SaxWorks partnership on Learn with The List. Um, this has been an amazing series. We didn't want to do new year, new you. We wanted to do level up, come into the year, shake off the previous two years, and let's just move forward. And today's session is really after two years of being forced into Zoom and virtual, it's about owning your space. It's about owning your presence and your power. And I just want to share right off the top before I pass this over to Leah, that one of the most important things that she taught me right off the bat was to lean back that I'm a real like lean in, sit at the edge of your seat, to, like show people that you're engaged with them. And then she said, whoa, 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 hold up too close. I was that I was crowding people. So I've learned like, this is the piece that when I hear Leah's voice in my head, when I'm in a Zoom, she says, lean back. And so I'm gonna lean back, let her take it away. I will be back for the Q and A um, to facilitate that. So please um, leave your questions in the chat and, Leah, take it away. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you all for being here. And I am Leah Bonvasudo. I want to make sure everyone can see me. And so we're going to go to gallery view so that everyone is actually seeing everyone. And that's my recommendation. If you go to the upper right hand corner, choose view and go to gallery view and let's see everyone. You could choose to spotlight me, but frankly, I'd rather you all see each other. And we're going to talk a lot today about how to bring yourself to the space and what presence even means. But thank you all for being here. My goal today is to bring you all some tangible tools to help you bring more personality, power, and presence into your virtual world. And can we all mute? Can everyone mute? There we go. Amazing. Thank you, everyone. These are the things we are here to talk about. This is exactly what we experience. Everything is exhausting right now, everyone. I don't have to tell you all that, whether you have little kids at home unexpectedly, whether you are in year two of this pandemic about to hit the third year mark, whether you are working from home or for those of you who are essential workers, thank you. Those of you who cannot work from home. And this moment is about our image, how we want to show up and how we want to project our energy and preserve our energy. Today, I don't want to talk about executive presence. I want to reject executive presence. I want to talk about a presence that is more personal, more powerful, 
and that helps each of you bring yourselves to this space in a way that feels intentional because we all know that it wasn't. We all know that we were thrust here years ago and it was scary and here we are and we now have an opportunity to make this more purposeful and to make our, our time here more present and more powerful. We're here to explore presence in a safer space and we can't guarantee safe spaces, but I work so hard to try to build safer spaces. And I really encourage everyone to come as you are today. As we learned in this series from the brilliant Casey Aaron Clark of Vital Voices two weeks ago, we learn best when we feel comfortable. We have trouble ingraining information when we feel unsafe. And so do whatever you want to do to make yourself feel comfortable today. If you're eating lunch, if you are watching over small children, if you're getting work done, keep your camera off. If you want to come on occasionally and then go back off, it is your choice. And that's a big thing we're here to talk about today. My goals today are for you to walk away with a framework for leading and hosting in the virtual world with more intention and more clarity, more safety, more consent. And I also want to share some practical tools to help you have more presence, more presence that is personal and powerful and not that is outside of you. It's too exhausting. I really wanna thank The List. The List is such an amazing community that I'm so grateful to be a part of. I wanna thank Saxworks. I really wanna thank Anne and Rachel and Cheyenne and Emily and everyone on the back end who's been working so hard to put this series together. And our past presenters in this series, Casey Erin Clark and Umbreen Bhatti, if you missed those, you can probably catch a replay soon. Brilliant talks from two brilliant people. And up next week, we have Natalie Nixon, who's gonna teach everyone how to access our creativity, followed the week after by Thaler Pekar, Elisa Kamahart Page, and Chanel Cathy in a conversation about conversations. So I wanna begin by introducing myself. My name is Leah Bonvasudo. I help people access and articulate their best ideas in their most stressful moments. And I do this because unfortunately, I know what it means to not be able to access our ideas in our most important moments because of debilitating anxiety, racing thoughts, all of the things that can get in the way and can distract us from the present moment. And my mother was a mime, which I joke about as an example of why it might have been hard for me to communicate. But really, she was a mime, which is, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to drop a picture in the chat because I want everyone to have some photographic evidence. My father is a Broadway musician. And this combined to give me a life in the theater, but I was completely unable to articulate myself unless I had a script, unless I was actually speaking someone else's words. I started to direct theater and I love to help people tell stories on stages of all shapes and sizes, but I still had tremendous anxiety whenever I had to talk about myself, whenever I had to talk about the work. I was so confident doing the work. At the same time throughout my 20s, because we know that theater doesn't pay, I spent 13 years as the assistant to a neuropsychologist. That was my day job. And I spent my time with him learning about trauma and anxiety and executive function and attention and what was missing in my communication. And about 10 years ago, I started to do the work I do now in public hospitals. And I started by helping frontline staff at one of the hardest hit hospitals during the pandemic, helping them articulate themselves in challenging moments, helping them de-escalate hard situations, helping them advocate for themselves and their colleagues. And today I have spent the last 10 years working with teams and organizations and leaders across all industries from tech to healthcare to financial services. And I help people own their power, own their presence and speak in a way that makes them feel confident in their workspaces. I'm gonna be dropping some links today, but I wanna drop for you some tools that I use. And this is a toolbox. We'll be accessing some of these throughout today. And in here, you're gonna see a lot of things, some handouts, some resources. At the bottom, there are tons of resources from Listers, Lister books, Lister podcasts, Lister articles. But really, I wanna talk about this work and, and why I do this work. 
first of all, I don't see myself as an expert here. I reject that. When I work with people, they are the experts of their own voices. I've worked really hard to become more of an expert of my own voice after being deferential to it for the first three decades of my life. But it's also really important that I mention that I have so much spatial and vocal privilege as a white person. And so I can only bring my very limited experience as a white person to this work. And I work with people of all different backgrounds and they are the experts of their voices and of their experiences. That this work is about doing less work, not more. And the people who come to see me, frankly, have been working too hard to communicate. And I want to envision a world where the people who are not working on their communication are doing more of this work. And I have to say, it is, I'm seeing signs of that. Most of my clients right now in this moment are cis white men. And that has not been a new phenomenon. They're not necessarily talking about it or showing up in my group coaching spaces, which is really disappointing. But I want for all of us to be doing this work because it leads to us working less hard in our communication, not more hard. And before we get into this work, it's really important for me to mention that I have one rule in this work and I keep it really simple because communication feels complicated. And when it feels complicated, it makes us have to work harder. And when we work harder, it doesn't work. And so I have one rule and one rule only that you can do anything you want as long as you're doing it on purpose, as long as you are choosing to do it. And to that end, I don't vilify any behaviors. Um is really, really useful sometimes. It's necessary for some of us to harness our warmth in certain spaces and actually play towards more deferentiality when it's useful and when it's on purpose in certain spaces. And so I want to encourage consciousness. I want to encourage presence, not perfection. And we know from important work from anti-racist organizers that perfection is a sign of white supremacy. And so let's do everything we can to build systems that are reinforcing the voices we have as they are and not asking us to change them or contort them. Okay. We're gonna get to in a little while how I would love for you all to interact in this space. I know we're all here together in a Zoom meeting, which is so exciting, but before we do, I want to invite you all to think about something. When the world went virtual, what changed for you? What changed in the way that you see yourself? And for me, I've seen so much change. I have a client who is a CEO and he considers himself to be quite short. I remember right before the pandemic we met and that was a big concern of his when raising money. Since the pandemic began, no one knows his height and he has gained some confidence from that just in the way he sees himself. I have a client who used to really need to have her full makeup done before she presented. It was like part of her costume. It made her feel more like herself. In the pandemic that went away, she doesn't feel like she needs it anymore. I have another client who's incredibly soft-spoken. Before the pandemic, we used to have to work for her to really project her voice in a conference room or when public speaking. But knowing that these platforms pick up our virtual volume more, she can now pull back and reserve that effort. So I want you all to think about what changed when the world went virtual for you. I will go first. For me, I stopped performing femininity. And it led to me actually having a change in my gender identity. It's been surprising and thrilling, but that's what changed for me. And so feel free to put in the chat, what changed for you? Feel free to contribute. And if anyone would care to speak up and have their voices heard, it would make me so happy, no pressure. Would anyone care to share vocally? Jennifer Owens, please unmute. I'd love to hear from you. I swear. It has um, reduced the idea of age. Wow. It really, I, I mean, yeah, I just think it's like, we're all kind of the same age. Yes. And just, okay. This is brilliant. I never thought of that, Jennifer. Thank you. I wish, I hope Marcy is from Encore is on here, whose yeah. work is in helping really alleviate the differences between our ages. Anyone else care to share? What changed for you when the world went virtual, good or bad? I'm looking in the chat. 
Danielle shared, I'm disabled and a disability ju justice activist. Meetings that weren't accessible suddenly are, absolutely. Absolutely, and we all, I have a lot of work to do in accessibility, which is on my list, absolutely. And thank you, Danielle, for bringing that up. Huge, huge thing to mention. And would, if anyone else would like to contribute, would love to hear your voices, otherwise put it in the chat. Colleen says, fewer opportunities for sporadic collaboration. Yeah, I'm a removal of boundaries, not the good kind. Yeah, absolutely. The walls between our life and work have really come crashing down in so many new ways. Leah? Yes, Ingrid. Add that um, while there have been so many different disruptions, there's also been, at least in my case, an increase in flexibility. Um, and so there have been ways that, of adapting to take advantage of the remote. And I really echo what, what uh, was Danielle was saying in terms of more access. And I really hope that spirit continues. I love that, Leslie. Thank you for sharing. And Ingrid? I'm just tired of seeing myself on the screen. Okay, let's fix that right now. Can everyone go to the upper right-hand corner? Select gallery view, which I hope you're in already, and then hover over yourself or click on view again and select hide yourself view. It's something we're gonna talk about later. We're all watching ourselves too much. Yep. And for those of you and like me who struggle with social anxiety or speaking anxiety, we are already watching ourselves from above. It's almost like there's this tiny camera and I used to say it was like I was in conversation with myself and the tiny camera. I was watching myself from above, right? I see lots of nodding, yep. And so if we're actually seeing our faces on the screen, it is making that doubly hard. It's making it less possible for us to feel present because no matter what, if I'm visible on the screen, I am going to look at myself because of my mirror neurons. And as we're gonna talk about later today, this is splintering my focus, my eye contact focus, which splinters my attention and makes it harder to access my thoughts. And so I have hid myself view and I invite you all to hide yourself view. If you work internally at work with a platform that doesn't allow you to hide yourself view, Teams I believe is still working on this, use an actual post-it note, hide yourself. You don't wanna see yourself put an app over it. And we'll talk about this a lot as we go on. Okay, everyone, we're gonna get into the work right now. Oh, I'm, yeah, Alyssa, thank you so much. Teams lets you minimize. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, everyone, I'm gonna share my screen. And, oh, you know what, Sax works, folks. Would someone mind making me a host? Thank you so much. Okay. I'm going to share my screen to share a quote from the brilliant Priya Parker, who is an expert on the art of gathering in her wonderful book. And Priya says that connection doesn't happen on its own. You have to design your gatherings for the kinds of connections you want to create. And so for those of us who are hosting on Zoom or any other platform, we have a responsibility to be intentional and to lead with clarity, confidence, and warmth. It's so important. So when I am preparing for a virtual event, I choose a few words that help to triangulate me, that help to answer the unknown questions, that help me prepare my mindset, not my content, so that I can go forward with more agency and more confidence. And this is rooted in an idea that if we can put our perspective on our audience, then we feel less in the spotlight. It takes the pressure off of ourselves. And we will always default back to the pressure that we put on ourselves. It's natural. And I love the way that Susan McPherson, an amazing lister, wrote about this in her book, The Art of Connecting, that we have to put the focus on the audience. And then what Susan says is to focus on connection. And these are my pillars of virtual communication. And these are the four that I work with. Now you could choose any words and you could also just choose one or two. I choose four because they're really important. And I'm going to drop in the chat a PDF that you can download with these pillars that go into detail about how I use these pillars. In this PDF, you will also see a list of my action items that I do before a big presentation, things like turning my computer on do not disturb. You'll see my list of best tips for setting up your virtual space. But I wanna go into each of these pillars in, in a small way to give you an idea of how I use them. 
And so for clarity, can everyone see me and hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Awesome. And it's really, really important that you actually ask that at the beginning of any virtual opportunity, because we're not talking about technical difficulties and we're doing everyone a huge disservice. First of all, because it could happen to any one of us and we might not know. And we have to have a shared language about acknowledging that there's technical difficulties without the shame and stigma that somehow comes along with it. So ask that question, it's essential. And when you do, you're giving everyone else permission to ask it as well. Consent is so important. Everyone, we are recording today. And I want you to know that if you want to share anything that you don't want to be on the recording, just let me know. You can chat me privately or chat to the whole group. And then I can simply pause the recording and then play it again. And so you could share something without it being recorded. Consent is essential in our spaces. Also in regards to consent, I invite people to put your videos on. You're invited to, but we cannot demand that people put their videos on. We are not on an even playing field in all cases. Some of us are going to have kids at home unexpectedly, dealing with technical difficulties, not feeling good about showing up online. And that is something that a lot of people experience just with visual dysphoria. And so making sure that this is an option and that people are consensual about them showing up this goes for screenshots as well. Inclusion is welcoming people to include their pronouns, but not demanding it. I know for me, when I was going through a transition and trying to decide on my pronouns, I actually took mine off for a bit because I felt like my old pronouns weren't doing the job, but I wasn't quite ready to share my new ones. And so make sure that this is an invitation and not a mandate. For inclusion also, it's very important to help people understand how to interact in the space. Some of us feel bad making that a statement, but I see it as leading to more clarity and inclusion. And so everyone in a group this big, I might not see you if you unmute and wave a hand, but please, if you want to speak, I would love to hear from you. Feel free to put a note in the chat and you could privately message me or you could chat. I will look there often. Or if you're not, not feeling heard, I really wanted everyone to speak up. So simply unmute, speak up, and I will stop talking. But again, the easier way would be to chat so that I can definitely make space for you, which I would love to do. That's why we're in this format. And finally, confidence. Confidence, confidence, confidence. If you know you're going to have a dis disruption, like a loud kid or a delivery that you need to be able to attend to. Say it with confidence and don't apologize. We really need to give everyone space to bring themselves to this space without the pressure of perfection. And so it's really, really important to let people come as they are and to say things with confidence. And when you do, we give everyone permission to do the same. We're now going to move into presence itself and I believe that presence is paying attention. Presence can be so many things. It can be a lot of things beyond what I put here. But quite frankly, most of us, because of that tiny camera or because of our attention feeling split, we're not fully paying attention. And the people I work with are brilliant. They are usually thinking while speaking. They're usually having five thoughts at once. They're usually multitasking to an nth degree. None of that is serving their communication. And then if we feel anxious, that is not being served as well. And there are so many things that can get in the way of our presence. And why don't you all chat? What's getting in the way of your presence? Feel free to put it in the chat box. What is stealing your presence? Raise your hands if you experience physiological nerves and distractions. If you experience palpitations in big moments, throat constriction, air hunger, difficulty breathing. You can raise a, a visual hand or a virtual hand. I experience these things very much and so do the people I work with. What about just racing thoughts, lots of thoughts and the thoughts go faster and faster. And then you try to speak quicker to keep up with them. And then you don't even take a breath and then you're having palpitations and you're not breathing, right? It really builds on itself. What about thoughts of how am I being perceived? What if I say the wrong thing? What if I offend, right? Did I say the right word? Seeing my face on the screen, 
Yep. What about finding the right word? Who here loses their train of thought? Who here finds themselves over-indexing face, facial expressions and really paying attention to what everyone is, is visually giving you in order to see if they are agreeing with you or not, right? All of this is stealing our presence, right? How about technical distractions, being worried about bandwidth, being worried about your connection, right? All of these things are stealing our presence. And for most of the people I work with, myself included, this is my experience, I can be very comfortable in a lot of moments and very confident doing my work. But the moment I have to talk about the work, the moment the spotlight's on me, I tense up, I escape to very analytical thought, I have a physiological reaction, and then I try to think my way out of it. Anyone have this experience? And so we need to take our attention back. We need to transform our anxiety into attention. We need to transform our habitual behavior into presence. Because when we're communicating, anything that is unconscious leads to unconscious thought, which leads to unconscious speaking. And so this work is about bringing consciousness to your communication, not perfection. We will always go back to the habitual thoughts, the habitual behaviors, the habitual sensations, because they are societal. They are not ours. They are ingrained from, for some of us, years of traumatic experience while speaking up. So what I recommend is getting present and practicing doing one thing at a time. For me, I find that communication and meditation are the same thing for me, except one happens by myself and one happens when I am with other people. And I want our communication to feel this calm, this present, this confident, this comfortable. And I really believe that we cannot communicate with confidence if we don't feel comfortable. I really, really believe that. And so when we are anxious, the nature of our thinking becomes more analytical. It becomes faster. And it's because it becomes rooted in our amygdala, the part of our brain that is our trauma center. And you will realize that when you feel comfortable, there's more alignment. You're fully breathing. There is a connection between your body and your brain. You're not efforting the way that you think. And so it's really, really important that we can use presence to trick ourselves into the present moment, to trick ourselves away from the habitual behavior and to give ourselves a job. It's just like when you're doing an automatic physical behavior, like washing the dishes or taking a shower where it helps you to think more freely. We wanna replace the part of our attention that is right now being stolen by anxiety or distracting thoughts or multitasking. We wanna replace that part of our attention with something, a tool or an anchor that is actually going to ground us in the present moment. That's gonna jolt us out of habitual behavior and give us a choice because the anxiety does not give us a choice. And in many cases, there are unconscious behaviors that are then feeding the anxiety. So today I want us to focus not on how we look, but on how we feel, and that is key. So everyone, I'm gonna stop my screen share now because I want to see you all and I want you all to see each other. And again, bring yourself to this in whatever way makes you feel comfortable. These are all exercises that you can do on the screen. You can also do on your own without being seen. This is your space to make yourself feel comfortable. And I would love for you to start prioritizing your own comfort, to reject the idea that confidence is the answer and to prioritize comfort instead. That's it. And I see it time and time again, that when we prioritize our own comfort, we are more confident. And that that should be the feedback we are giving people at work to help them find their comfort. So presence is activated through a few words. And I want to explore just the three I had on the screen before, spaciousness, stillness, and silence. And with spaciousness, this is not just about the space we're in. Right now, I have a candle going because it helps me stay in the space. These devices 
they want to suck us in. They want to absorb us. And when we get sucked in, as a lot of us are leaning in, as Anne said, unconsciously, right? That leads to us speaking faster. That help. That leads to us over-indexing people's facial expressions. It leads to us not feeling our own bodies or accessing our breath. It's cutting off my access to my gut, which is where my expertise lives, where my passion lives. It is making it harder to breathe. It's also increasing my cortisol and decreasing my testosterone, which we know from Amy Cuddy's TED Talks, is making me more likely to feel anxious and less likely to feel powerful. And so no matter what your virtual setup is, I want everyone to think about leaning back. And do it now. Lean back. And if you were seeing yourself, we could make some adjustments. And you want to be taking up space on the screen. So for me, I have a pillow here, which is really propping me up. I like to sit cross-legged in my chair because I'm short and my, my legs don't reach the ground. So it helps me to really consolidate the bottom of my body while being expansive up top, right? We want to avoid leaning in and making ourselves small because it signals to ourselves that we're afraid. And so everyone, can you just have some heart protrusion? Can you lean back? Can you adjust your screen so that you're taking up a three quarter space but that you don't have to have that inch between you and the back of the chair that is tensing your body. And camera angle is really important here too. If we are too low, we look intimidating. We don't look like we are really with people anymore. And we see this all the time with talking heads on news programs. If we're too high, we can look like a talking head and we really are not taking up a good amount of space, right? But we wanna play with camera angle, which before I had this fancy standing desk, I was using a bunch of Mark Bittman cookbooks. And it is really, really important to be able to know how you're being perceived and then to hide yourself, everyone. And so finding an angle that works for you, that helps you capture yourself in three quarter view, but also lean back is key. Also comfort here, everyone. I am not in an office chair. I don't find them comfortable. They're too big for my body. I'm five foot nothing. This is a velvet living room chair. And it feels like, I'm, honestly, it feels like a throne. I love it. <laughs> but it really holds me up. And I can sit cross-legged in it with quite a lot of comfort. And I love that tip from Casey two weeks ago about letting your butt be big and that that releases all the tension in the lower half of your body. This is the same idea. And this is not just in the virtual world, everyone. I used to joke before we went virtual that Sheryl Sandberg did us a huge disservice by telling everyone to lean in because I would walk through office buildings and see conference rooms where everyone was just really eager to be there and leaning in and making themselves small all the while constricting their bodies and restricting their access to their ideas. Yeah, Casey Clark writes, good girl posture. Oh yeah, I reject, yes. And so when we lean back, it is everything. That being said, I lean in on purpose when I have more power and authority. I don't find that this is effective on video really ever, if I'm honest. I just don't because any kind of motion towards the screen is, is not really doing myself any service. It's also just taking up too much space for the entire conversation. But in person, if I'm meeting for the first time with a new client who is visibly uncomfortable, I will make myself small. I will make that person feel more comfortable. I'm doing it on purpose. When I work with white male CEOs who have way too much confidence and authority, seemingly they admit otherwise to me in private, I help them make themselves less comfortable because they need to. They are assuming too much comfort in the space and they need to share it. And we all have to have this awareness about our own privilege and power in the space and how our own confidence is effective and what we can do to help everyone feel more comfortable. So do we have any questions about leaning back? This is one of my favorite topics. Not only does it create this embodied cognition that is so important for our confidence, but the almost most important part of it, if I am gonna be honest, is that it's just different from what I normally do, right? It makes me 
have to bring myself to the present moment. It makes me conscious. It jolts me out of habitual behavior. And that is the benefit of every tool we're going to talk about today. I said to a new client last night, I don't have the answers, but I have a ton of ideas and all of them are designed just to jolt you out of habitual behavior and give you a choice. And that's what we need is the choice. Laura Miranda Brown wrote, I am always cold no matter what. It makes me lean in or cross my arms. Laura, if that's happening when you're anxious, it is a sign of circulation. It's a sign of breath and not oxygenating your body enough, which we'll talk about momentarily. If it happens all the time like me, Laura, I'm always cold, always, always. I actually in deep winter will work with a hot water bottle on my lap. You could also try a heating pad. When we feel nervous, sometimes we feel cold, but I'm cold all the time. So those are some tips, but really I have, I have, a, I have many more in that regard. <laughs> yep, Stephanie says they have a warming pad, fantastic. Yeah, love that. So everyone, moving on to eye contact. Unless there's any questions or thoughts about leaning back and spaciousness, doing anything you need to keep yourself in the space. Amazing. So everyone, let's talk about eye contact. Who here has a tendency to look up and away when you're thinking? Yep. Great. And everyone, you know, I just want to make a overstated example. You know, it's something that we see so much. It's just really common in our society. I think that these devices have magnified it a lot, but, you know, um, we really tend to speak while we're thinking and, and think while we're speaking. And, you know, we really speak and, uh, and then we kind of like take a left turn without even knowing. And it's really a very circuitous way of speaking. And we're really suffocating ourselves when we speak like this, because I'm not even breathing and I can't even really access my own ideas. And then we're really afraid to show that we're thinking, right? It's, it's really a problem. And so we tend to think and speak at the same time. And a lot of us speak this way because we feel like we should. And, and quite frankly, because a lot of us speak this way, it's really contagious too. How does it make you feel? How does it make you feel? Yeah. Anxious. Me too. Eye contact is key. I met with a new client yesterday who, brilliant attorney, who kept having a brain freeze and he didn't know why it was happening. And it was because in moments of thinking, his attention was literally being flung to the ceiling. And that's because where we look, so goes our attention. The mind-body connection is incredibly strong. And we know from vagal nerve theory and fight or flight, we know that we have a greater ability to impact our mind with our body that we do to impact our body with our mind, which means that we need to make big physical changes in order to help ourselves feel more confident, which means that if I have unconscious eye contact that is really out of my control, then so will be my thinking, really. And so we find conscious thought by using conscious eye contact, which does not mean matching eyes with someone else all of the time. It is not possible, it is not effective. And in the virtual world, we have so many options in this regard. And so we've already talked about hiding your self view because no matter what, if you are on the screen, your mirror neurons will go there. But I wanna think about eye contact as a place to come home to, a consistent place to return to, as opposed to feeling like I'm free falling. The thing about eye contact is that the same part of our brain that controls deep thinking controls eye contact. So for my clients who are having a lot of unconscious eye contact, it's a sign that they are going into deep thought on their feet. And the unfortunate thing about this is that it's signaling to their body that they don't know the answer. And it's signaling to those around them that they don't know the answer. And almost always when you are on your feet speaking off the cuff, you know the answer. You know it, you just have to access it. Almost always. And so think of your eye contact within a bubble. And when you look off to the side, it's incredibly obvious that you're thinking. And this doesn't even have to be in the end of a thought. It can be, you don't even have to continue the same thought when you come back. 
But can you see how my eye contact is rooted now? It's staying in our mutual space and it is helping me control and conduct the pace of my interaction, the rhythm of my communication. And this is preventing me from getting ahead of myself, okay? So think about eye contact, not in the mode of needing to maintain it all the time, because when we're on vi virtual communication, we don't know where we're looking, but as a means of focusing your attention by focusing your eye contact consciously. So, and Jane, yes, Jane, I would love to hear from Leah, you. When, I think one of the reasons I dart off to the side, I'm sure it, it, it I never realized it, it is what you're thinking, thinking about what I'm gonna say. But I also find when I keep looking straight on at people, um, all I take in is their reaction and, mm -hmm. and I wanna take care of them, you know? So like, I always feel like when I wanna focus on me, I have to look away to really be in me. Does that make any sense? It makes so much sense. And if we don't use pauses when we're speaking, then we have no time to think, right? But yeah. I want to recommend that you actually look off to the side, but yeah. keep it within this bubble so that we're not flinging our attention to the ceiling. Oh, oh okay. But just making it conscious to look to the side instead, or I look down at my left leg. That's my thinking space, but it only works if we're pausing and using silence, which most of us are not. But does huh. that make sense, Jane? Okay. Yeah. I just, um, okay. <laughs> I'll try. Yeah. It's hugely important. And that brings us to silence. Most of us are not using pauses. We're afraid to stop and think for a moment. And most of us are going at a really fast pace because the anxiety is dictating that. And so if we can work in conscious pausing, it actually increases our audience's retention and comprehension 30 to 40%. And I'm doing it right now. I'm pausing at the change of a thought. I'm taking a breath. And if I wanted to think for a moment, if I was asked a question, I could signal that I'm thinking by looking off to the side. And that gives me a space to think that's mine. And it actually removes the intensity of the eye contact for a moment. Now I've gotten really, really good at thinking on my feet deeply while maintaining eye contact. And that's something that I work really diligently with my clients on. But most of us need more pausing. Most of us want more spaciousness in our communication and most of our audiences are grateful for it. And so I really recommend pausing and working in conscious pauses. For those of us who experience palpitations, we're usually taking in too much air, actually. And so it's essential to learn how to breathe more deeply in order to not only be able to reverse palpitations, but also to then create the pausing that creates more of a rhythm in our communication. And so that brings us to silence, which we're talking about now. Who here has a tendency to fill the silence? Yeah, me too. I call it conversational responsibility. I used to think that I was doing a great service by filling the silence. I thought that, well, I don't enjoy speaking, but I can do it, so I should. And it wasn't until recently that I realized how much space I was taking up. And so I really play with silence now, not just to give myself time to think, but to give people more space in the conversation. Raise your hand if you experience breath-based anxiety, palpitations, air hunger, throat constriction. Yeah, me too. This is a factor of taking in too much air, too much hot air, and it's not really getting down into our abdomen, into our diaphragm. And so we need to work on actual deep breath in order to access that. But the fastest way to get through a series of palpitations is to do what I did about a half hour ago and get, well, not a half hour ago, an hour ago now, get rid of the excess air. And so you just wanna You want to avoid the open mouth inhale. That's what's feeding anxiety and that's what's feeding palpitations, okay? And that's what's gonna create dry mouth and more of an ability to lose your train of thought. And so going deep is going to be key. 
And so I've given you just a few ideas today about presence, about spaciousness, about stillness, about stability and silence. There are so many other words that we could explore, sociability, softness, sensitivity, structure. A lot of what we talked about today, I wanted to create a strong structure for you so that you feel free, so that you can be you, so that your warmth can come through, so that your personality can come through. So all of these tools are just a distraction mechanism away from the habitual behavior, away from the anxiety and into the present moment. And that is where we thrive. I'm gonna bring Anne Choquette back in. I am so happy to talk through some questions to breeze through this chat. You were amazing. I just, I see some claps. I feel like we should give you some claps. I'd I love to hear it. Oh, I want to give you, yeah. Thank you. I'm gonna clap for all of you. Thank you, thank you for bringing your presence today. It's the most important part. I um, took a lot of notes um, and uh, I think that there are, everybody, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat. We're going to, I think we've got a couple of minutes. You don't mind a couple of more minutes. Can you, I feel like, wait, I want to start back at the beginning with what I learned. Can everyone see and hear me? <laughs> I'm a good, I'm a good student. Um, I also leaned back and worked on my, on my framing. Um, and I really particularly was interested in what you were saying about where you're, eye line is right are you up too high and looking down i find that i i posted um on my instagram uh what my zoom space looks like because my computer right now is really raised up like it's it is it is eye level um and i'm not looking down into it or or up into it so um i thought that was really incredibly valuable um i want to start with a question i actually have a question um Oh, look, I looked away. Sorry. Hold on. I'm going to look. <laughs> no apologizing. <laughs> and you realized it, Anne. So celebrate realizing it because that's the work. Thank you. Um, my question is about an uncomfortable conversation, right? That you go into a meeting, you think you're like, you've got the stuff, you've got the whole thing, you know what you're saying. And then the surprise the thing that happens in the moment, the, um, when the, when the palpitations come, not from the anticipation, right. But from the uncomfortableness of the situation, talk about a trick that we might use yep. in, um, in the moment. So when it happens, we tend to get thrown out of our bodies and we fling to the ceiling and we watch from above, right. We have to do everything we can to tether to the space we're in and to keep ourselves in the present moment. So when I'm, I'm anticipating a hard conversation, if I have the luxury of such, I have things all over my desk that keep me rooted in the present moment. My kid made this for me at school because it has these really tactile things that I can touch. She calls me a shyness coach because she's really shy and she knows what I do. And so this helps her at school to keep her focused in the moment and to prevent her mind from racing and to getting into real anxious thought. So that's the first thing is to do anything you can to keep yourself in the space. But if you're like me, I need structure and I need some sort of framework to help me know what to say because I have speech anxiety. And so I have a feedback formula that I use and it is a three-parter. It's super, super easy to remember and to put into practice in the moment. And it's really good for giving feedback or receiving feedback. Y'all want to hear it real quick? Okay. The first part is a benefit of the doubt statement. So something like, I know that we've been working really hard on this. The next part is a statement of fact. And so the first is warm, the second is strong. The statement of fact is not to be softened at all. It is exactly the feedback you wanna give, which could be the way that you're receiving the feedback that you're being told. And the third stop is a invitation or a creative solution forward. 
All right. So I need that framework on my feet in order for me to have a structure to put what I want to say into. And we could use any other framework. You could make one up as long as you have something that feels like a lifeboat to hold on to. Does that make sense? Thank you. I want to point, there's a question in the chat, um, which I think is really interesting um, from Mallory and um, Laura yeah. also about being younger. Yes. and feeling less confident. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. A lot of us automatically become deferential with seniority. And this is really a problem. And in a lot of cases, I see it show up when people are really confident with their clients, right, in their actual client interactions. But then the moment they're managing up or their boss is seeing them, they lose their ability to feel confident because they defer to the other authority in the room. And it's hugely problematic. And it's really, really essential that we maintain our own authority by remembering that the people who are our bosses want to see our confidence. They need to see our authority. And so most of the time, those behaviors that are making us feel younger are usually having to do with warmth. And this is you know, a very studied spectrum. This has been studied by Matthew Kohut and John Neffinger and Amy Cuddy, the strength warmth continuum. And the, I, I really wanna mention that these are three white social scientists. And so these words have a lot of weight for a lot of different people. And so they really have to be adapted and subjective, but that if we understand the strength warmth spectrum, we can understand where we fall on it. And then we can give ourselves more permission to go to one end of it. And Alicia Menendez, an amazing lister, has a great book about this and particularly how it impacts women of color and black and brown women. And that book is called The Likeability Trap. But I really recommend thinking about the strength warmth spectrum and how you can give yourself permission to explore more strength. I just took a second in the chat and added the three steps. Thank you. You. Um, you are welcome, Carla. Um, I love that about strength. Um, I think that's great. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question. If anybody wants to put a question in the chat. I'm putting the Harvard Business Review study here about strength and warmth too, because it's really fascinating. It also shows in the study that we think people look for our strength, but they actually look for our warmth. It's very interesting. It's really interesting. What other questions do you have? I can't believe this is a shy group. <laughs> Or, you know, the, the Zoom meeting can do that too. So what other questions does anyone have? I also want to drop the collection of tools in the chat again. Again, this is resources and PDFs and worksheets and a bunch of resources I love from a lot of listers in there too. Any other questions? No. Yeah, Rachel, I love that book. Yeah, Laura. I have a particularly unique problem, not really problem, but situation. I'm, I am nursing a baby and oftentimes I end up with calls despite my best efforts from, you know, 11 to 12, which is feeding time or three to four, right? How do you, how do you stop that from happening? Um, so I'm often starting a call on video, stopping the video, having to continue the call through the video and explain what I, what I need to get across and then coming back on because I have found that it makes other men, it makes men very uncomfortable to have me on video while nursing. I don't care. It doesn't bother me. I'm wearing like a thing with, that I can wrap around myself, but they like, you can see them. They go, Ooh. <laughs> um, do you have any tips on how to manage um, a presentation when you can't be seen and you're just you're just being heard and you you can see them reacting but they can't see you. I find that really hard. Yeah, absolutely. At the beginning of the call, I would without apology say I'm going to be nursing on and off throughout this call, so you might see me turn my video on and off. That's it. That's it. And if anyone new comes in, you want to repeat it super concisely. No apologizing. If you feel like it's helpful, you can say thanks for understanding, but I don't think that's necessary. 
but definitely mention it at the beginning and then that's it. And then no comment about it on and off. And I would encourage you if you're mentioning at the beginning then to not have to give yourself the extra labor of turning your video on and off. If you're comfortable with that, you could simply also do a camera adjustment if you have an external webcam. Is that helpful? And yeah, to answer the just, second part of your question about when you're not seen, but they are, right? And sometimes we have the opposite problem where we're, we're seen, but no one else is. And the problem is that we, are, we have more of a likelihood to fall into the space because we're seeking the validation and connection that we're not getting. And so even more, you have to double down into your own space and root down and keep yourself spatially oriented so that you don't get absorbed into other people's perceptions. Yeah. This is so valuable. I, I'm going to take this recording when we get it and watch it again and again. I never knew the trick about uh, turning off your own self view, which um, oh, that's life changing. Huge. It really is huge. Uh, the um, there your website and social media tags are in the chat along with Saks Works um, and The List. Thank you very much. Um, I thank you so much, Leah, for bringing us your presence, your energy, your space, your advice about leaning back. <laughs> I have notes. Um, it was a pleasure to spend this hour um, with you, learning from you. I thank you all so much here. The List, The Big Life, the Saks Works community, um, for bringing your own power and vulnerabilities into this space. And I am grateful for Sex Works also for helping us bring this together. Thank you, Rachel. It, it Thank is, you all so much. It's such a pleasure. It's been so wonderful learning from you. <laughs> yeah, I have, I've been practicing along, like experimenting with my screen, and um, I do feel like we, like I can have a, a like a very small moment of radical sort of transparency, like plant balanced on Clorox wipes, little bottle. So, and um, may or may not have fallen once or twice, but is here now. Um, we all do what we got to do. And I, I'm so excited uh, about everything I learned during this session. And I, I loved how active the chat was. And um, and I always learn so much with these Learn With The List sessions. And it's really been wonderful. So thank you so much, Leah. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, The List. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, we have put all of our resources in the chat. Take a moment to copy paste as you wish. Um, we just added our event calendar. It's the first time I think that we've we've just gone out with it because it's uh, it's a little bit in beta, but you are you are seeing it. So please, we have some cool stuff coming up and more of these amazing learn with the lifts. Uh, Thursday, one p.m. is uh, appointment viewing. So and then you can uh, go to saxworks.com and get that free day pass. So please come see us and please come back and join us in whatever space is comfortable for you and enjoy being present in that space. However, however makes you comfortable. Thanks to Leah. And we will see you all hopefully again soon. Thank you again. Have a great Thank day. You all.